No conflict in the Middle East goes without mentioning the two dominating powers of Saudi Arabia and Iran. Often simplified by their characteristics of being Sunni and Shia, or Arab and Persian, these powers are not always at odds. Hello all, it's Ibrahim here from the Thursday Report. Welcome to the first of our three-part series on the modern history of Saudi Arabia and Iran. With the conquest of King Abdelaziz and the third formation of the Saudi state, the young king started to turn away from visions of expansion. His eyes were now fixated on the recognition of his domain by his neighbors and world powers around him. After crushing the Akhwan rebellion and the expansionist elements within his own forces, Abdelaziz cemented his rule at home and sought to cool any opposition from abroad. Meanwhile, across the Gulf, the ruling Qajar dynasty, who ruled Persia for 140 years, experienced great instability on the back of military defeats to the British and the Russians, effectively splitting the empire into two spheres of influence, one belonging to the Russians and the other belonging to the British. This paved way for Reza Khan, brigadier general of the Cossack Brigade, to rise to power. Filling the political vacuum left as the Qajar's hold on power significantly diminished, Reza Khan became Reza Shah, orchestrating a successful coup, he seized Tehran, establishing the Pahlavi dynasty, finally replacing the Qajars and promising to modernize the Persian Empire. Soon as a result of negotiations from Prince Faisal of Saudi Arabia, in exchange for basic guarantees of Shia holy sites in the kingdom, Persia and Saudi Arabia formally recognized each other. As Reza's son, Muhammad, replaced him on the throne, relations remained cordial. In the coming 20 years, the states began to develop closer ties with visits from heads of state to Tehran and Riyadh Qomin. Formal visits continued after King Faisal's ascension to the throne, until it was cancelled in 1968 due to Iranian protest, as the Saudis backed the Bahraini call for independence that opposed the Iranian claim to the island. Bahrain was a British protector at the time, while the Iranians claimed the island as part of its own borders, historically a province. Yet this dispute proved to be a minor one, as the two nations continued warming to each other, with King Faisal and Muhammad Reza Shah becoming relatively colleagues in the international stage, signing agreements over various islands around the Gulf. Their distant cooperation continued and resulted in King Faisal receiving military support from Iran, encountering South Yemen's air raids into the kingdom during their Al Wadiya war. Iran, on the back of slowly warming relations with Saudi Arabia, dropped its territorial claim on Bahrain and joined the establishment of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or OIC, headquartered in Jeddah. The two nations even worked together to pressure Iraq on pulling out of seized border posts near Basra, with the Iraqis fearing a coordinated attack from both the Saudis and Iranians. Although they were going friendly to each other, King Faisal and Muhammad Reza Shah were not ideologically on the same page. Both came from different philosophies on how to govern a nation, and what path and how fast the nation should go. In one letter, the Shah wrote, Please, my brother, modernize. Open up your country. Make the schools mixed, women and men. Let women wear miniskirts. Have discos. Be modern. Otherwise, I cannot guarantee you will stay on your throne. With King Faisal's reply, Your Majesty, I appreciate your advice. May I remind you, you're not the Shah of France. You're not in the Elysee. You are in Iran. Your population is 90% Muslim. Please don't forget that. King Faisal would come to be known as an economic governmental modernist, yet a socially political and religious conservative ruler. A more fitting reflection of his population at the time. He opposed hardline societal modernization based on the West, while Muhammad Reza Shah preferred the boot when guiding social change. Economically in the 70s, Saudi Arabia was further cementing its place in the world of oil leading the oil embargo of 1973 and continuing to dominate the oil scene. Meanwhile, Iran was rising in relative comparison to South Korea and Taiwan, with economists predicting Iran's ascent to the first world coming. Yet unlike Saudi Arabia, why the Iranian society wasn't as stable. The Shah deposed once by a democratic government of Mossadegh, returned again in a coup backed by the US and the British. Due to his reforms and policies, he again found himself losing touch with the larger working and conservative classes. The Shah only seemed to enjoy concrete support from the relatively socially liberal elite around the country, while communist and Islamist groups continued to haunt him. Assassination attempts were made throughout his reign, and unlike King Faisal, he never succumbed to one. As the Shah continued pushing reforms including women's suffrage, greater rights for minority religions amongst many, he alienated himself from the Shia religious clergy, who had great influence in society from towns to villages. 
In a country where the Shia clergy held significant power and lobby historically, the Shah enacted reforms that sought to break up their land holdings. Opposition to the Shah grew public and obvious, with the future Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini, a largely influential clerk at the time, criticizing his reforms harshly. And in the city of Qom, a central part of the clergy class, Khomeini gave speeches against all of the Shah's reforms, especially the right for women to vote, establishing relations with Israel, and then calling for the overthrow of the Shah. Khomeini was exiled to Iraq and then to France. The unrest escalated and strikes and protests spread all around the country and it was obvious the revolution came to stay. The Shah fled the country. The cancer he was suffering from in his late reign worsened, resulting in his death a year later. Shahpur Bakhtiar, the Shah's late prime minister and vocal opponent, dissolved the Shah's repressive secret police, Sabak, and freed all political prisoners and allowed for Khomeini's return. Factions around Iran began wrestling for control from the newspapers to the streets. The political system and the revolution was being made, and as the ashes settled on the complex revolution, Bakhtiar and others were politically outmaneuvered. As Khomeini returned from exile, he came victorious. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you all enjoyed our first video on the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Our next episode will cover the aftermath of Khomeini's revolution and Saudi Arabia's very own internal and external struggles, pitting both states actively against each other for the years to come. If you would like to show support for future episodes, leave a like, comment and subscribe for more videos. And if you'd like to discuss ideas, join our communities in the description box below. See you all next time.